the Battle of Cape St. Vincent turned Horatio Nelson into a national hero. The battle, where the Royal Navy defeated the Spanish Navy, was fought on the 14th of February 1797. It wasn't so much a St. Valentine's Day massacre, but it did make Nelson the darling of the British public. The French Revolutionary Wars pitted France against her old enemy, England, or, as she was by then, Great Britain. Whilst France had success on land, Britain's Royal Navy had kept them from launching a cross-channel invasion. With just over 140 warships versus 84, the Royal Navy dwarfed the French. However, in 1796, everything changed. The French were joined by a new ally, Spain. And if the Spanish fleet could join the French fleet at Brest, they could outnumber and outgun the Royal Navy. Admiral Sir John Jervis was sent to Cape St. Vincent to prevent the Spanish from doing just that. And there he stayed, watching and waiting. Finally, on the 4th of February 1797, the Spanish fleet set sail from the Mediterranean, bound for Brest, under the command of Admiral Don José de Cordoba. Having sped through the Strait of Gibraltar, as they closed on Cape St. Vincent, a heavy fog descended on the Spanish fleet. It also descended on a lone Royal Navy frigate, racing towards Admiral Jervis. Commodore Horatio Nelson, already a bit of a hero in the Royal Navy, but unknown to the general public back in Britain, was in Gibraltar when he heard of the Spanish fleet's movements. He set out on a frigate, HMS Minerva, to warn Jervis. On the night of the 11th of February, in that thick fog, Nelson sailed through the Spanish fleet undetected. He found Jervis on the 13th of February, warning him that the enemy fleet was nearby. The only problem was that due to the fog and the dark, Nelson hadn't been able to ascertain any numbers. Despite that gap in his intelligence and the continuing fog, Jervis prepared for battle. John Jervis had turned 62 the previous month and had been in the Navy for just under 50 years. Even now, despite a stoop, he was a strong, burly, blunt and strict commander. Early in the morning of the 14th of February 1797, Valentine's Day, the British fleet heard the boom of Spanish signal cannon through the fog. And then as the fog started to lift, Jervis saw what they were facing. He was outnumbered by 27 ships of the line to his own 15. Not only outnumbered, he was outgunned too. The Spanish had 2,600 guns to his 1,300. The Spanish flagship, the mighty Santissima Trinidad, boasting 130 guns, was the largest ship afloat at the time. Seven other Spanish warships present that day also had over 100 guns. In comparison, just two ships in Admiral Jervis's fleet had 100 guns, HMS Britannia and his own flagship, HMS Victory. And if you're thinking, wasn't Nelson on HMS Victory at Trafalgar? <laughs> You'd be absolutely right. Launched in 1765, HMS Victory remains to this day a fully commissioned ship in the Royal Navy. The oldest vessel still commissioned in the world. At this particular battle, Nelson was however on board the 74-gun HMS Captain. And whilst the Spanish possessed those monster ships carrying over 100 guns, the majority of both their ships, as well as those of the Royal Navy, at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, were actually 74-gun warships, like Nelson's HMS Captain. Despite their numerical disadvantage, the Royal Navy were actually in far better shape than the Spaniards. Their gun crews could fire three broadsides to every two the Spanish could manage, and their discipline and seamanship were second to none. British captains at that time could expect their ships to be ready for action in 10 minutes. That meant cabin walls dismantled, gun crews and marines formed up, or in the latter case, already perched in the rigging. Ammunition brought to the gun decks, those decks wetted and sprinkled with sand, and finally the gun ports opened and the guns run out. All in 10 minutes. This disciplined seamanship was in marked contrast to the Spanish. A lack of training and time at sea, along with an over-reliance on men pressed recently into service, left Admiral Cordoba under no illusions that it was a lot more equal 
than the ship numbers suggested. And even as the fog started to lift, the disorganised nature of his fleet was clear to see. A small division, numbering nine ships, had managed to move ahead of the rest. A gap had now opened up in his fleet, and Jervis decided to take full advantage of that error. At 10.57am, he ordered his fleet to form a single line of battle on his flagship. It took just 30 minutes for his whole fleet to manoeuvre into that single line. And now Jervis signalled, Pass through the enemy's line. He was going to split their fleet to even the numbers a bit more. And in the vanguard of his line was Captain Thomas Trowbridge on board HMS Culloden. The 39-year-old Trowbridge had entered the Royal Navy in 1773. His ship, the Culloden, had been built in the dockyards at Rotherhithe on the River Thames in the 1780s. The Spanish Admiral ordered both sections of his fleet to turn north, apparently to sail down the flanks of the British fleet and then head towards the safety of Cadiz. If Admiral de Cordoba wanted to get out of here as fast as possible, that was the last thing on his British counterpart's mind. Jervis wanted a decisive encounter, to leave any idea of the Spanish joining the French quite literally dead in the water. As they sailed past, the Royal Navy raked the Spanish fleet. With HMS Culloden having successfully sailed through the line and the Spanish fleet heading north as fast as they could, Admiral Jervis now ordered Trowbridge to tack around 180 degrees and lead the line in pursuit of the main enemy fleet. After the first five ships of Jervis's line had turned, the smaller Spanish division tried to cut through the Royal Navy lines to reach the larger formation, which was already trying to put clear blue water between themselves and HMS Culloden. The discipline and training of the Royal Navy sailors, along with the independent action encouraged in her captains, once more came to the fore. Each Royal Navy ship closed with the ship in front, preventing any opportunity for the Spanish to break through. And after several attempts, they swung away. Meanwhile, towards the tail of the line, Nelson, on HMS Captain, recognised that in the time it would take for the whole Royal Navy line to turn, the main Spanish fleet could escape. He decided to use his initiative. Disobeying Admiral Jervis's order to remain in line, Nelson turned his ship hard to port. Then, cutting back through the British line, he sailed straight towards the mighty Santissima Trinidad. This action would change the battle and raise Nelson from Royal Navy hero to national hero. When we watch films like Master and Commander and Horatio Hornblower, it's easy to believe that ships turned and almost immediately were alongside their enemy. The reality was far slower. Painfully slow. It took Nelson 45 long minutes to come alongside the Spanish. And all the time he was being fired upon, not just by the Trinidad, but also by four more Spanish ships. Most of HMS Captain's rigging and her wheel were shot to tatters. There was a danger that the lone wolf would become a lame duck. But his actions had indeed slowed up the Spanish fleet, and now HMS Culloden, leading the British line north, was catching up and engaging them. Meanwhile, his example had been followed by other Royal Navy captains who had turned out of line and were bearing down on the Spanish fleet. Cuthbert Collingwood, commanding HMS Excellent, delivered such a series of broadsides that the 74-gun San Isidoro struck her colours. As he sailed to assist Nelson, Collingwood racked the 112-gun Salvador del Mundo as he passed. Before that Spanish ship could recover, she now came under attack from HMS Orion, captained by James Sumares. It wasn't long before the Salvador del Mundo also struck her colours. Sumares, a native of the Channel Island of Guernsey, now took on the Spanish flagship, the Santissima Trinidad. In the confusion and smoke of the battle, Sumares thought that the flagship had also struck her colours. But before he could board to accept the surrender, the Spaniard was towed away by another Spanish ship to safety. Meanwhile, Collingwood had sailed further up the Spanish line to aid Nelson. He delivered a broadside at the San Nicolas from a distance of just 10 feet. The force of the impact caused the San Nicolas to swing away abruptly, straight into the 122-gun San Jose. Collingwood had set the stage for the second event that sealed Nelson's rise to darling and hero of the British nation. Nelson now rammed the San Nicolas, 
And then with a shout of Westminster Abbey or glorious victory, Nelson personally led a boarding party onto the stricken Spanish vessel. The ferocity of his attack soon forced the Spanish crew to surrender. With the two Spanish ships entwined, Horatio Nelson now led his men on to the San Jose, quite literally using one captured ship as a springboard to attack another. The Royal Navy would later refer to this type of action as Nelson's patent bridge for boarding. The crew of the San Jose also surrendered to Nelson. It cemented his reputation within the Royal Navy, but now it elevated his name to the wider British public too. Despite the damage he'd actually inflicted on the British ships and the fact that nine of his ships had not even been engaged in the battle, Don José de Cordoba realised that there was no way his battered, disorganised and demoralised Spanish fleet could continue to fight with Jervis. At 4.30pm, he ordered his ships to disengage and race for the safety of the port of Cadiz. The Battle of Cape St Vincent was over, and it was a decisive Royal Navy victory. Four Spanish ships had been captured, 250 Spanish sailors had been killed in the action, and a further 3,000 had been taken prisoner. The British losses, on the other hand, had just been 300 men killed and wounded, and no ships lost. Admiral John Jervis was created Earl St Vincent by King George III. After a 61-year career in the Royal Navy, he would finally retire in 1810, and died in 1823. Nelson, the new darling of the British public, was made a companion of the Order of the Bath and was swiftly promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral. And the rest, as they say, is history. The only downside of Nelson's actions at the Battle of Cape St Vincent was that it totally overshadowed the valour and contribution of other ships in the Royal Navy fleet that day, as well as their captains. After all, men such as Trowbridge, Sulmares and Collingwood had all contributed to the victory as well. Nelson's good friend, Thomas Trowbridge, would serve with him at the Battle of the Nile. He would rise to the rank of Rear Admiral. He was on board another survivor of the Battle of Cape St Vincent, HMS Blenheim, when it disappeared in a storm off Madagascar in 1807 with all hands. James Sulmaris eventually rose to the rank of Admiral. Whilst he also served with Nelson at the Battle of the Nile, the two were never close. He died in his native Guernsey, in 1836. And as for Cuthbert Collingwood, well, he's going to get his very own episode in the future, so keep your eyes peeled and make sure you subscribe to my channel. Whilst Admiral Jervis and his officers were fated back in Britain, the same hero's reception did not await Admiral de Cordoba. Upon his arrival at Cadiz, he was dismissed from the Navy and banned from ever attending the Spanish court. His flagship, the Santa Sima Trinidad, would, like HMS Victory, fight at the Battle of Trafalgar as part of the Franco-Spanish fleet, but on that occasion she would be captured and she would be scuttled the following day. When you look at the number of ships lost, the Battle of Cape St Vincent wasn't a devastating defeat for the Spanish, but it was a huge strategic victory for the Royal Navy. The Spanish had been forced to retreat to Cadiz where they remained under blockade from Jervis. They would never combine with the French fleet to create a parity with the Royal Navy in the English Channel. Unchallenged in the seas of Western Europe, Great Britain was able to continue to fight the war with both the Republican and then Napoleonic France. But even more than that, the victory at Cape St Vincent had provided the British public with a much needed boost in morale, and above all, a brand new naval hero, Horatio Nelson. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story, and if you did, then why not watch another one of my videos about Nelson's battles? Lots more coming your way, including Cuthbert Collingwood, how Nelson lost his arm, and the Battle of Ferozeshah in my Anglo-Sikh War series. So, make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of them. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.